But most people are not meeting their daily intake of your fruit and vegetables. And so that's not even hitting 20% of your minimum required an amount, which is, you know, not a lot, five servings a day. So not a lot of us are hitting that. So we're eating a lot more ultra processed foods than we need to, and we're not getting anywhere near getting the adequate amount of fruits and vegetables into us. So when you look at that, you think, We've got to change. That's got to be the first place that we work on. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Become Your Own Therapist podcast, the podcast where I try to put myself out of a job as a clinical psychologist. Uh, Today, we are going to be talking about uh, nutrition and mental health. So very interesting topic. I'm excited uh, to have uh, Dr. Ju- Julia Rutledge today. She is a professor of psychology and clinical psychologist in the School of Psychology, Speech and Hearing at the University of Canterbury, uh, the director of Tapuna Toyora, the Mental Health and Nutrition Research Lab, theme leader in the Child Wellbeing Institute and co-author of The Better Brain. Um, which we'll be talking about today. Um, Originally from Toronto, Canada, she completed a PhD at the University of Calgary in clinical psychology, and in 2000, she immigrated to New Zealand. Her interest in nutrition and mental illness grew out of research showing poor outcomes for individuals with a significant psychiatric illness despite receiving standard conventional treatments. For over a decade, Uh, Her lab has been running clinical trials investigating the role of broad-spectrum micronutrients in the treatment of mental illness, including ADHD, mood disorders, anxiety, and stress. Julia has over 140 peer-reviewed publications, including in The Lancet Psychiatry, JAMA, and the British Journal of Psychiatry, and is currently on the Executive Committee for the International Society of Nutritional Psychiatry Research. She's been the recipient of many awards, including the Ballon Award for the New Zealand Psychological Society for significant contributions to the development or enhancement of clinical psychology uh, in New Zealand, being named as a woman of influence in New Zealand in 2015, 2018, and 2021, and a Braveheart Award for her contribution to making Christchurch a better place to live. Um, She also has a TED Talk, and she's had... uh, Uh, many appearances on podcasts that are very similar to this and I am very excited to have her on. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Okay, great. So um, as as you probably know, the podcast is about, um, you know, to what degree we can all become our own therapists. And I saw your TED talk and, uh, you know, what we eat and nutrition just came off as something that is uh, so useful in this regard because, uh, you know, we all eat. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I I just, uh, maybe we can start with just uh, what got you interested in in nutrition as a clinical psychologist? There's, there's not much, uh, you know, not many clinical (laughs) psychologists I know that have this interest. (laughs) This is true. That's right. (laughs) Um, So what got me interested? I did my, as you said in my bio, um, I did my training in clinical psychology at the University of Calgary, and that was in the 1990s. And when I was doing my PhD, my supervisor at the time, my PhD supervisor, Professor Bonnie Kaplan, who's now retired, um, she, she had been approached by some families who were using nutrients to treat very serious psychiatric problems like bipolar disorder, like psychosis, like depression. And this certainly jarred with my, the training I was receiving at the same time, which was that only medications and or psychotherapy can treat serious psychiatric problems. And I certainly wasn't taught that nutrition had any role whatsoever in the treatment of, of uh, psychological problems. So I was, you know, interested, I mean, I, and I have great respect for Bonnie and, you know, she wouldn't just take this lightly to, to start exploring whether or not there was any validity to their claims. And, um, what happened was that she, uh, you know, she ran some very small clinical trials at, towards the end of my PhD. And then when I went off to Toronto and I did a postdoc, um, so she and others were publishing, um, published some 
uh, pr very preliminary clinical trials in early part of the century, showing people getting well and staying well. And these were people who had serious problems like bipolar disorder. And they, she showed their symptoms getting better over about a six month period in conjunction with a reduction in medications. So that's got to be a good thing if you can reduce your medications, given the side effect profile associated with some of the medications that people have to take. So this was intriguing to hear about this. And, but, you know, I was trained as a, psycho a psychotherapist and, you know, to do, um, you know, cognitive behavior therapy and, and other types of treatments. And so that was my passion. And that's what I, you know, I had, you know, that was my, my, my career path. Mm -hmm. But moving to New Zealand to take on an academic position, I so soon realized by doing more and more research that not enough people were getting well with our current treatments. So you go into, I, I don't know if this, this happened to you, but you, 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 you go through graduate school, you learn about all of these techniques and all of these different therapies. They sound amazing. And then you apply them. And then you realize that your, your client base isn't quite the same as the ones who have been in, in all of the research. They've got all yeah. these co-occurring problems and they've got great mm -hmm. complexity that isn't very well reflected in the studies that are done. And they don't seem to do as well as, as, you know, you'd hope, um, obviously mm -hmm. some people could do really well, but that was, that was my experience was that not only through clinical practice, but also through research, what I was observing was that we were studying, I was studying ADHD at the time and that people weren't, you know, we'd be, I'd, I would be assessing these kids who were taking Ritalin on the, you know, receiving the best conventional care. And yet they still had symptoms of ADHD. In fact, they, many of them still, you'd say they meet criteria for ADHD. And so you have to pause and go, how good are we doing? How good is this? Mm -hmm. Is this as good as it gets that you're given the best treatment and that you still have the problem for which you're being treated for? So I guess in my opinion, that just wasn't good enough. And so you, you combine this sort of realization that many people aren't doing as well as we would hope in combination with these uh, clinical observations that Bonnie and others who are publishing their own people doing, you know, responding really well to these micronutrients, these vitamins and minerals um, made me change my direction in my career. So I hope that answers your question about why did I get interested in this? <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely does. And uh, I've, yeah. I've also seen, uh, uh, you know, the research showing that things aren't necessarily getting better in the in terms of people's yeah. mental health and, and there's increased oh, exactly. resources. And yeah, it's exactly. Scary. And Exactly. I mean, we are, we're training more and more psychologists here in New Zealand. I don't know if that's happening where you are. Mm -hmm. um, more and more people are going on medication. You can just, just, there's, there's certainly lots of research that's published the increasing number of people on medication. That's, you know, that can, in some places it's doubling over a five-year period. So it is a, a really massive increase in the number of people on prescriptions. 17% of the adult population in New Zealand is on an antidepressant. So it's not that we're not trying and it's not that we're not, they're, they're not receiving something that's supposed to make a big difference. And yet the numbers mm. keep going up. So you can't help but kind of go, well, at some point, this has got to flatten out and go back down again if the treatments are making a big difference. But mm -hmm. the number of people I have heard from over the last decade since I started doing this work are in the thousands. Thousands of people have contacted me. Thousands and thousands is what I would say. Sure. Um, and that's as a consequence of the TED Talk, uh, mo mostly. Mm -hmm. So I get contacted a lot. And it's often those stories of, you know, my husband, my brother, my son, my, you know, my daughter, you know, whoever, myself, um, struggling with mental health issues, a variety of different problems. I've been put on this medication, that medication, that medication. You just hear this long list, a string of different things that have been tried and to no, no great avail. They're still struggling. And so I've heard these stories and we need to listen to those people. We need to pay attention to them because we can't just dismiss them as being treatment resistant or treatment failures. Mm -hmm. It says something about our current 
way of, of operating, that it's not good enough. So I, I've heard enough about that. I've, um, you know, studied the data and so, and we've got our own data as well, where we recruit people who are taking conventional treatments and still su such a significant portion of them are still struggling. And so there's that um, clinical experience over the years of hearing people not do well. You, yeah, you, so it's, it's something that we do need to pay attention to and we just need to, it can't, we can't just throw more and do more and more and more of the same thing. It's gotta be, we gotta get to a point where we say, you know what, we've got to also be looking at new innovative ways of thinking about this. And so that's, sure. that's what got me into the area of nutrition and seeing the positive benefits of people using nutrients to treat their, their psychiatric problems is what's kept me in here. So I wouldn't still be here 15 years later if we hadn't seen positive results, but it also has led me on this journey of, of, of starting very naively, really knowing nothing about nutrition. As I said, n didn't get much of an education in my graduate uh, training in nutrition. It was deemed pretty much irrelevant to mental health. I don't know, is that how what you got? Is that the kind of education that you got as well? Yeah, not a, not a single word on it. Yeah, not a single word. There you go. That's that, that, tell, that says it all, doesn't it? Not a single word, which makes you you know that basically it's a it's irrelevant that it it's, it doesn't matter what people are eating. So the journey that I went on was that I I heard about them using vitamins and minerals in pill form, and that's the the trials that I started in about two thousand and seven two thousand and eight small trials, and then we got into randomized control trials. Um, and so it was a pill form, you know, I've, I've, there we go. Pills. I don't know if you want to see the, your list, your viewers yeah. want to see that. It's not, you know, that's, that's what we would give people, um, vitamins and minerals and a pill. And, and then we observed people getting well. And my first big, big clinical trial was with ADHD, adults with ADHD and hearing the stories of, you know, really quite substantial changes in a generally a fairly short period of time, but not in just the ADHD symptoms. It was, um, we would hear about just feeling calmer. Um, their emotions were less dysregulated. Um, they seemed to be able to sleep better. Um, they were coping better with the stressors of life. There was just a lot of sort of quite a, a broad range of, of improvement in overall functioning, which at the end of the day is what you want to see. You don't want to just see yeah. symptoms in one very, very specific area get better. You want their lives to get better. So yeah. it was really, really intriguing to hear these stories. So, so then it forced me to have to learn about food. Right. <laughs> so, so it's not that your typical journey, you'd think people should first <laughs> learn about food. So I did it a little bit backwards. And mm. so I started to, I had to get interested in why, why is it giving people vitamins and minerals? Why is it that that seems to make a difference? Don't they get these in their food? Like, how could you mm. possibly need any more vitamins and minerals because I, at that stage I was told, you know, just eat a good diet, whatever that means, um, and you'll be fine. And so, yeah. so it's led me to explore the food environment, learn about the food environment, learn about how our food environment has changed so substantially in a very short period of time, you know, less than a hundred years. And we've introduced all these foods that our ancestors, uh, didn't know what, you know, they, they would never have seen these foods mm. before. So we've got this, these, all these new foods that we've not evolved to digest or to use. And, and then we're now, we're now seeing the consequences of it. We are now seeing the chronic um, health issues that have been associated with the food, the nutritional environment, the foods that people are eating. And the ones that people are familiar with are things like, uh, you know, type two diabetes is what we hear about, or obesity or cardiovascular risk. And mm -hmm. what has been ignored is the role, it, the, the role that it's playing on our brain, mm -hmm. the impact it's having on our brain. And that's the, 
that's the research that I, I think I bring to the table is that I'm now linking the nutritional environment to brain health not just me. I mean, there's a lot of other people as well. So I'm not doing this single-handedly, but I've definitely participated and played a big, I hope an important role in highlighting it, highlighting that our food environment is just not adequate, even if you're eating a, what would be deemed a good diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it must, it must've been such an interesting journey to, and such an unexpected one. I'm sure in your training, you didn't expect that this is where you'd be at, at this stage of your career, researching how food has changed in you know, the past no, centuries. no, no, not at all. Not <laughs> at all. Not at all. Um, it's, it's, yeah. But then, you know, it's been interesting. And, you know, if I think about the research I was doing before um, I got involved in nutrition, I would just say it had, I wouldn't see it as being impactful. Like, yeah, it was interesting. I suppose it was interesting at the time for me. And um, I was looking at neurocognitive functioning of kids and adults with ADHD and, you know, all kinds of psychosocial problems that they were having. So I was documenting a lot of impairment, you know, all the problems that they were struggling with, but it wasn't leading to any new solutions. It wasn't going to, you know, have a breakthrough in terms of let's how can we make their lives better. Whereas I'm, I think that's why I like this work is that it is having an impact. It is having a positive impact, and I'm bringing something unique to um, people who are struggling with mental health problems. And at the end of the day, that's why I went into this. That's why you probably go into this. Is that why lots of people go into this? Is that they want to make a difference? I just didn't think that it would be. I would be doing that through, um, you know, teaching people about what they're putting in their mouths. But you know what, you know, dietitians aren't doing it. Nutritionists aren't really doing it. I mean, then maybe they're, they're starting a little bit, but they're not, they don't have the expertise in mental health. And so I guess, you know, you have to bridge that in some way. Um, and so, you know, connect with people with those other expertise. And that's certainly something that I've been doing. Um, but there isn't this unique, you know, you know, the nutritional psychiatry that's, you know, the, having the mm -hmm. both, expertise covered is is um a very unusual so i guess mm -hmm. now that i've 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 now gone into all of those rabbit holes about food i guess i i feel somewhat um more confident about talking about it because i kind of think i probably do know something about it by now <laughs> so <laughs> but not but not through any formal training other than you know conferences and things back when we could go to conferences yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I'd love for your for your book to be incorporated into our, our master's programs. It's, Thank you. It, it's it's so it's so relevant. It's I mean, it's something we all do anyways. We all eat, um, and and people here. A lot of uh, part of the reason I started this podcast is because a lot of people here don't have access to medication or to therapy. It's quite it's quite expensive. So mm -hmm. you know, this this is something that. Actually, you know, even if they don't have money for therapy, they can just sort of change the, the, the groceries they're buying in the grocery store, just swap some things out. You know, you don't need extra funds or, or transport exactly. money or services. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, exa it, exactly. Hmm. Yeah. Go, go for it. So, yeah, I mean, that, exactly right. Is that... Um, the, what what I hope the book can do for people and um, is that it gives them more confidence to take charge of their mental health. And so, you know, we've been through, you know, there's been a lot of talk around go see a therapist or go through, you know, go see a counselor. You've got mental health issues. Go talk to someone. Go see a professional. And as you say, there's that's expense that can be unaffordable for some people, unreachable. But at the end of the day, there aren't enough of them to go around. So I've done the the crunching of numbers in New Zealand. So I don't know if they're if it's comparable in South Africa, but mm -hmm. knowing that we train maybe at best about um, 80 uh, graduate students a year. That's how many get uh, graduate from a clinical psychology program in New Zealand. And you look at the number of people who are struggling, which is about 
you know, a fifth of the population, which is a million, you realize quite quickly, and you look at the number of people who are registered as psychologists, and you realize that there's, there's no, there's maybe one psychologist for every 300 people who are struggling with a mental health problem. So Mm -hmm. when you crunch it that way, you kind of go, well, they can't, one psychologist can't see 300 people a year. That's impossible. And so we have to do things differently. Mm -hmm. And and that's where I, I really hope that the, the better brain can empower people to learn how to, one thing that's in their control, and that they can learn how to look at food really differently. And they can start mm-hmm. thinking about food from its nutritional value and how it, how it plays an important role in brain health, in all of the things that your brain is doing, all of the chemical reactions that are happening in your brain they're all completely dependent on the availability of nutrients. So when you you realize that, then you, hopefully you start to, as you say, you start to make different choices and that you, you know, hopefully you start to become interested in how do I, how do I nourish my brain? What are going to be the better choices for, you know, for me or for my family, for my children to optimize their health? So it is, I hope it does make a difference on that front and that it also starts to teach people that ultra processed foods are not doing anything good for you. Nothing. There isn't a study out there that's ever shown that it's good for your health. So, you know, that's got to stop, you know, at some point that hopefully that will sink in and go, (laughs) wow, really? Yeah, it doesn't do anything good for your health. Why do we eat it? Why would we see this as an acceptable form of feeding ourselves and feeding our children? And there is a lot of, you know, I understand the, the, um, financial aspects to it and appreciate that that plays a role is that these ultra processed foods, well, they fill you up for a while. You don't, you know, you, you may not feel hungry for a while, although you're more likely to feel hungry quicker if you eat those types of foods. And they are cheaper at the supermarket, so they'll lull us into buying them because they're cheaper. Um, But, you know, and so at an individual level, I get it. I get how, why we make some of those, those choices, but we also need to factor in, and maybe this is, you know, this will definitely be harder if you're just going from, from, you know, day to day existence, it's going to be harder for you to look at your future. But at the end of the day, you're far more likely to have health issues that are going to cost you a lot of money and the healthcare system, a lot of money if you keep eating those foods. So if we can, you know, get people to sort of recognize and appreciate that, then that's an important aspect. Um, Mm. I remember hearing someone, um, uh, some, an insurance, it was like an insurance broker or someone who worked for an insurance company in South Africa. Mm. And I can't remember what the name of it was like vitality or Mm. is that sound like a discovery? Yeah, Discovery is the health insurance, yeah, and then Vitality is like a, a subcomponent that they have. Okay. Yeah. Oh, is that okay? So I'm remembering that right? Yeah. And so I I loved her talk. It was at a conference just before COVID, and but the reason I liked it was, and actually I talked about, I thought. I, I, we'd had it in the book, but I think it ended up unfortunately getting cut in all, you know, how you have to shorten it up and stuff. So it may not, mm-hmm. I think it maybe it got, it might've been taken out, but um, the bottom line there was that the insurance companies were rewarding people for making good choices at the grocery store. So mm-hmm. when you per- made good choices, then you got, de- I don't know exactly, maybe you got deductions on your insurance premiums, or there was some kind of bonus and reward mm-hmm. system for making better choices. Mm. There you go. I mean, yeah. So you st- you you might pay a little bit more, but your insurance premiums might be lower. So you know, there's there's you know there there are people who recognize that we really do need to be changing this. So it was, it was really interesting to hear about that that side of it was the role that insurance companies were playing in trying to help people make better better behavioral um, you know make some behavioral changes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, my partner's actually on on Vitality. So she, if she goes to the grocery store, she gets points, and then she can cash it out ah, okay. for more for more groceries or for plane tickets. Get discounts on plane tickets and all sorts of. So, things. so am I describing it right? Around that you get yes. rewarded though for making good, positive choices for your health. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Great. And 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 I wanna um, you know I, I you use the word empowered. That's such a it's such a good word for your book and your work because it really puts the power 
back in the individual. You're not saying, you know, you know, come to me and I'll, I'll help, you know, I'll solve your problem. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can't. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're putting the power back in the individual. I think that's what I really liked about the mm. book as well. And yeah. I, I, in the service of, you know, the, the audience who are listening, I just got circling back to that ultra processed food. Um, you had a nice section in the in the book about what to look out for in terms of, you know, ultra processed foods, what to avoid. Um, firstly, you know, just for those listening, what, what counts as ultra processed food and, and how can they sure. avoid some of these items? Yes, sure. So we, we talk about uh, food in three different levels. There's your real whole food. That's your apple picked off the tree. Okay. So that's your, uh, you know, that's your, your, um, your, your nuts, your, your beans, your legumes, your, um, your, qui well, I guess quinoa, your, uh, your, um, lentils, your fish, your, you know, your grass fed beef, those types of foods, your real whole foods. You've got your processed foods, which is things where it's been, it's been altered in some way. In fact, some of those foods that I've just described, they may, if you, if you cook it, then technically that's processing. That's in describe, that's a form mm -hmm. of processing. So heating anything, um, pasteurized milk would be a form of post pro of processing because you're changing mm -hmm. it from, um, from what it was and, you know, heating it up in order to uh, make it safe to drink. Um, your canning is a form of processing. So, but if it's just your, your canned tomatoes, your canned pears, that's fine. Unless, you know, you've added a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of salt is being added there, or you're, you know, you put it into like a, a sugary syrup. Um, but, you know, overall that should be a fairly low form of processing. Frozen vegetables, that would be another form of processing and absolutely fine. Your nutrient levels, if you're, but your frozen vegetables can sometimes even be higher than if it was fresh because it is frozen at its peak. So I just want to give your, your listeners uh, examples of some things that are fine and they're great and they're important and they're part of being able to store your food longer than, than if, you know, having to eat it right away, if you just, you know your apple that takes off the tree isn't going to last forever. So mm -hmm. ultra processed though is where it's where you, um, the, the food is being massively chemically changed. It's been, the things are taken out of it. It's stripped down to its core essence. It's like taking your, for example, your, your sugar cane, your beet, your sugar beet, and, and tur it's turning into just that table sugar where everything, all the nutrients have been removed from it. And all you're done, you're left with is that one molecule that has the sweetness associated with it. And everything else about it has gone, has been taken away. So even the fiber that you might have, if you were to eat it as a, as a plant, that's all gone. Anything is all gone. And so you're just mm -hmm. down to that essence of it. So that's an example of an ultra processed food. Um, mm -hmm. Other things could be your, you know, the, where they've, they've done that, they stripped things out of it and then they add things back in. So they might add in flavors or emulsifiers, you know, to keep the texture of it, or they'll, they'll put in preservatives or, um, your um, colors, your food colors, and you'll know about them because they're on your packages. There'll be all of these E number, like often those, it's a number on the package of the, the of your product. And, and they do have to say what the ingredients are. So when you have a long list of ingredients, that is definitely a clue that it is ultra processed. So you're often your, you, you know, like your soups could be, a lot of soups are really ultra processed if you start to read the, the labels, um, your uh, cereals, all the cereals are ultra processed. All of your breakfast cereals that, you know, your Weetabix or your Cheerios, your cornflakes, those are all ultra processed. Um, we have been led to believe that is the best way to start our day and I won't go anywhere near it. So, um, in the better brain, we give a, a, a a recipe for muesli so that people can learn how to make their own breakfast cereal if they want to. But I mean, other great breakfasts would be just, you know, just 
fry up two eggs with a bit of toast and some, you know, lettuce, maybe some uh, hummus or, you know, some spinach, your some avocado on the side, some tomatoes, and there's a breakfast. I mean, it's not, it's not hard. So, um, so hopefully that gives your listeners a little bit of an idea of the different types of foods. And so what we encourage in the book is that you really reduce to eliminate those ultra processed foods and you cut it down. And yes, you can have that once in a while as a treat, go and have an ice cream. And, and that's, that is absolutely okay. You're having it with your grandchildren, whatever, you know, enjoy it, but certainly don't do that every day. So it's a treat. It's an, you know, and, and that's that it, it has a, you know, its role, its place. But the sad thing is, is that when we look at people's diets and we look at the big population studies where they look at what we're eating, that's sobering. And that's really been a big push of the book for us was Mm -hmm. uncovering these huge studies that show that over 50%. And I think the latest stat was something horrendous. It was like 16 to 9% of the foods that children are eating would be deemed as ultra processed. So, yeah. So, so, so the, that, that our, our foods are the the majority of the food, 69% of the foods. Sorry, I'll just say that again. So I'll get it right. 69% of the foods that a children are eating on a daily basis would be deemed ultra processed. So that tells you they're, you know, maybe 30% of their diet is real whole foods. And most people are not meeting their daily intake of your fruit and vegetables. And so that's not even hitting 20% of your minimum required an amount, which is, you know, not a lot, five servings a day. So not a lot of us are hitting that. So we're eating a lot more ultra processed foods than we need to. And we're not getting anywhere near getting the adequate amount of fruits and vegetables into us. So when you look at that, you think we've got to change. That's got to be the first place that we work on. We can't supplement. I mean, yes, we've shown with supplements can make a big difference for people's mental health, but I wouldn't start there. I, and and it's because of these stats. It's because of these horrendous stats going everyone's eating this ultra processed foods and it's we we've we that's got to change if we want to change the epidemic of the mental health you know the the sorry the the um mental health crisis and you know how many people have got mental health problems we've got to start here and look at this food environment and you couple all of these data that i'm telling you about about our terrible food habits as as you know from what you know your country to my country i'm sure it's similar um and then we look at the role you know if mom eats these foods you know western Mm -hmm. style foods during pregnancy it has a detrimental effect on the on her offspring so there's you know they're starting life on the back foot it's not it's not good Mm -hmm. you know And we all play a role in this we all hold a responsibility no matter what we are eating personally we all can play a role in changing this and, you know, voting for people, voting for people in government who are going to make, you know, actually take care about this. I haven't seen a government that really does yet, but Mm -hmm. um, maybe one day. Hmm. Mm, yeah, yeah, I think that would be great. I also haven't, haven't seen that. I mean, I mean if it's not even in our, our clinical programs, you know, um, for go- or for medical government school. To- or, or medical yeah. school. Yes, I actually have uh, doctor friends who say that uh, they had uh, just a like a term module on nutrition and not much else. I was quite shocked that even you know medical doctors don't get extensive training on nutrition, let alone no. you know so, psychologists. Um, exactly. But, uh, yeah, and if they do get it, it'll be on. It'll likely be about. Um, probably about how, you know, how to help people who are, might be underweight or obese, you know, obesity. It won't be about uh, how do you use nutrition to help people with their mental health problems that probably won't be touched on at all. Okay. Okay. That's even, uh, that's even more grim, but I, I, I agree with the, um, yeah, of having, having governments and, and also people to make different decisions because I, I guess we hold the system in place with our, our con- 
with the decisions that we make on a daily basis as the supply is, you know, increasing the demand. Uh, oh, sorry, the demand as the demand is increasing, the supply is, is there as well. And and I, I, I wonder, um, for once once we've got these, once we stop purchasing these foods, these ultra processed foods, and we reduce that, what what do we fill that gap with? I know you speak about, you know, just general brain health and and how a lot of these foods have a sort of uh, a generalized effect on on the on the brain rather than, you know, thinking that you just need this specific kind of food. You, you, you actually, you speak about a Mediterranean diet and, yeah. and, um, so, so for those listening, you know, what sorts of uh, foods are, are good in general for, for brain health? And then yeah, maybe we can speak sure. about psychiatric disorders, uh, toward the end. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is, it's a minefield. If you're someone who's kind of thinking, I'd like to change my diet. I know I don't feel good on it. Um, I know I'm not supposed to be eating these foods, but what should I eat? And Mm. so, and if you, if you start, you know, going on to, you know, the internet to say, what should I eat? Um, you find it incredibly or omnivore or, um, keto, or, you know, should I be low carb, high carb, uh, you know, high, high in protein, high in fat, et cetera, et cetera. So it's confusing. Mm. And so what we try to do is try to make it really, really simple. And that is just, don't worry about all of that and don't get, you know, this, there's no counting of calories. There's no, you know, weighing things out or thinking about your macro, you know, the carbs, fats, or proteins. You're just going for the balance. You're looking for the rainbow of colors in your dish. So you're looking for making sure that you get a great variety of fruits and vegetables. And I would just say, eat fruits and vegetables that are in season, you know, don't, you know, don't worry about it too much, you know, go to your farmer's markets and find out what's in season, chat with the people. I mean, I've learned a lot by going to farmer's markets and you look, you see, you find a, a vegetables. I think I have no idea what this is. Like, what <laughs> the hell do what I do with that? Um, talk to the grower talk to them, ask them, what do I do with this? And they'll, they love to share their recipes with you. They love to tell you what to do. You know, they're, they're there to sell it. Right. So Mm. have that, have those conversations, have those. And then that social interaction will be good for you as well. So (sighs) I would, I would, I would be getting curious about what to do with different things. I myself have, you know, been on a journey of learning more about food. And I, you know, I, for example, I've learned a lot about how to cook with lentils. And we talk a lot about that in the book. And, uh, you know, we've got some recipes in the book as well. And I make a point of really trying to learn how to use things like the, uh, your black beans or your lentils. And there's a whole bunch of different colors of lentils and you can and use them in different ways. And, but the reason that I, I personally am on that path is because it's much cheaper. So they're Mm. incredibly nourish and nutrient dense and they're super cheap. So they're really a good Mm. choice. And so then I can be authentic. And in, when I, people say, oh, I can't possibly eat well, you know, it's going to be too expensive. I'm like, well, have you, you know, here's a whole bunch of ideas and recipes where it's affordable. And our, our, our recipes in the book had that at the back of the mind. When we, we got a chef involved in developing those recipes, we said, we want them to be affordable. It needs to be something, these need to be ingredients that people can source cheaply. So that was definitely a premise of uh, behind all of those recipes. So those, yeah. So that, you know, what else is it? You're, you know, you make sure that you're getting the good sources of your omega-3 fatty acids. The best place to go for that would be fish. Um, mm-hmm. And again, you'd have to think about that locally. What are the sort of cheaper options around fish? Um, your nuts, your seeds, um, uh, if, you know, uh, your, um, if I think I've covered it. How, how am I doing? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for okay. covering you most go. of what I, is, what I read. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the med- that's, so we say it's consistent with the Mediterranean diet, but, um, we, I don't want you to think pizzas and pasta necessarily that it can, it's, mm. it's broader than that, that it is, 
you know, it, it is about getting different full, uh, food groups in. Um, you know, dairy would be included, get, making sure you eat lots of eggs would be important to your cheese, your, you know, to as sources of protein. Um, you know, certainly there's, we don't say, we don't say anything about going vegetarian. In fact, the research shows that that might not be so good for your mental health. So we're quite open to the full range of real whole foods, but certainly not your, your corn fed food. So we, we would hope that you'd be sourcing out your grass fed. If you are wanting to eat meat, then it would be, I would be recommending grass fed because it's going to be healthier for you. Mm. Yeah, and, and uh, I think there was a, a section where you mentioned that for those who are vegetarian or vegan, it's important that they focus on, on some specific uh, things that they, yeah. they should supplement with. Um, would you yeah. mind just, just sharing that for those who are vegetarian or vegan? Yeah, so the, the big worries for vegetarians are not getting adequate sources of B12. It's hard to source as a, vegetar as a vegan or vegetarian. Um, Choline is hard to get, actually. That's something that if you're vegan, you need to be mindful of as a specific nutrient. Um, the omega-3 fatty acids. Now, there's that's broken down into different types of fatty acids and, and omega-3 mm. fatty acids. And the ones that we talk about specifically that have been researched for brain health are EPA and, and DHA. And they are specific types of fatty acids that you will mostly get out of your fish. And it's hard to source from your seeds or your walnuts or your flax seeds, which is often recommended for getting omega-3 fatty acids. But the thing is that the the, for, the type of omega three fatty acids is called ALA, um, and mm -hmm. that will um, that is hard to convert to EPA and DHA. It's very you don't it's we we're not very good at doing that conversion. So mm -hmm. um, so if you are vegetarian or vegan, you'd be wanting to probably supplement or eat algae, but you'd have to eat a lot of algae. Like you'd have to, you know, I went and, and did a comparison of how much sea, seaweed you'd have to eat relative to fish. Yeah. And it's a, um, it's, it's kilograms relative to grams. So it's a lot. Um, so it'd be pretty hard to do. So it's, or, or you go for looking at a supplement and see, and just making sure that you read the label and you look for your, how much of EPA and DHA, because you're looking for trying to consume about a gram to two grams a day. So, and that's been shown to be what's, what's important for mental health. So, yeah. So if you, if you can't get it, source it directly from your diet, then I would definitely be looking at that. It's harder to get iron, you know, you know, a bioavailable iron out of a vegan vegetarian diet. So, you know, getting your iron checked may be an important um, thing as well. So there are some things you just need to be mindful of if you're going to go down that that route. Then it's not, you know, there I know really, really healthy vegans and vegetarians, super healthy. They have amazing diets and it, they do really well and they thrive on it. There are others who don't. And mm -hmm. I've certainly had a lot of stories over the years of people whose mental health was really suffering when they were on those types of diets. And then they add a little bit of meat in, and it seems to make a huge difference. So mm -hmm. it is about eating for your, you know, for what's going to be best for your own health, because we're all can be quite different. So we just need to be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I, I, I will let you go before the hour, but I, I, would it be okay if I do a rapid fire round of go, some go psychological okay. disorders? And then what? Okay, okay. sure. So, so yeah, I'm putting, you on, <laughs> I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire through some, some di yeah. diagnoses and then you can okay. tell me what, what sort of from your research, what micronutrients slash foods ah, or I whatever. Can, can I... Can yeah, I yeah, preempt yeah. that? Or, well, I would preempt sure, it sure. now and say I wouldn't, I won't recommend something different for each disorder. I, so you're not going to okay. get that from me. Yeah. Okay, so if you're saying schizophrenia, I'm not going to suddenly say certain specific single nutrients that you should be definitely consuming versus, um, uh, you know, if you were depressed or if you were ADHD or whatever. So, um, oh. and it's not that there isn't research on that. Like, it's not that there, there, there are mm. single nutrient studies that have been done on specific conditions and disorders as you're, you're asking me about. And I, mm. I, you know, I was reading, um, there is another book, Oh, Your Brain on Food 
food. Uma Nudu, I think her last Naidu, name is. Naidu. Yeah. Naidu, is that it? Okay. Mm. Not, yeah, you're right. She does that in her book and takes yes. different disorders and then says, if you have this, then these are the nutrients that you should be consuming. Uh-huh. And I guess I just... Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, uh-huh. I'm wrong, but I, I've come to the conclusion after 25 years in this field is that the disorders are not discrete. They're not these unique things that, you know, that, you know, you, you're this part of the brain is about schizophrenia or, or whatever, or this neurotransmitter is what's going, you know, if that's out of whack, then that's going to cause mm-hmm. this specific disorder or another disorder or whatever. And while there are some, you know, neurotransmitters that may play a greater role in say regulation of mood or the emergence of psychosis or attention, it's n- it's not a simple like you know black mm-hmm. and white or you know absolute cause and effect so mm-hmm. and given that the research that we've done on different disorders we're always giving them the same broad array of nutrients we never change mm-hmm. it so we use the same broad array if we're if i'm doing a study on anxiety or if i'm doing a study on depression or if i'm doing a study on adhd we give the same full range of nutrients those about 30 essential nutrients um uh, that you need to consume every day, preferably from your diet, but if you're not from a pill, and then we see what happens. And we've seen benefit across the you know different conditions. So I guess it makes me think, I don't know about the single nutrient, you know, just sort of uh-huh. hand picking a few of them. Um, uh-huh. I guess I don't want to go there. Yes. Okay. So Thank I'm you. Not gonna help me, I'm not going to help you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. No, no, that's, that's fine. I, I actually, um, so I, I read the, the, the general chapter about the, um, you know, the foods that you eat and, uh, I sort of skimmed through the, um, yeah. the, the psychological disorders chapter. So I, I yeah, think yeah. that's where I've, I, I think I, I assumed, it. yeah, because I, I read Dr. Uh, Uma Naidu's book as well. So yes. I, I actually, I just assumed, I sort of overlapped there and assumed that they would yeah. be, but that's very, I think, important yeah, no, for the audience so, to know. So, yeah, no, what we do in the ch- different chapters is that we talk about the different studies that have been done in those different areas. So we take, say, for example, the studies that I've done on ADHD or that we have a whole chapter on stress as a consequence of living in a very stressful environment and a bunch of different stressors happening in Christchurch. Um, so I've, I talk about the research that I've done there, but we're still using the same broad spectrum approach, um, but we're just telling people about the the our results with respect to different disorders. So it's I guess that's a little bit different from what Uma does because she goes through and she um, mm. uh, does review the specific single nutrients that you might want to target. And that yes. that approach is one that I'm not in great favor of. There's a lot uh-huh. of great things about her book, but that's definitely not one of them. Yeah. Cause it's, okay. uh, it's making it too, I think it's just too, it's, 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 um, it's not recognizing the complexity of the brain. It's not recognizing that biochemical reactions require a whole bunch of different nutrients to be a- available. So, and it's, you know, mm-hmm. if, to make dopamine, to make serotonin, you need the full array. There's nothing special. There's no sp- special single nutrient. So I'm not in favor and I don't want mm-hmm. to um, propagate that idea because I don't think it's helpful. Of course. Thank you for, yeah, for clarifying that. I think yeah. it's helpful. It's Not enlightening for me and I'm, I'm sure for my audience as well. And I, I, uh, I see we're out of time, so I don't want to hold you back. Uh, thank no you so problem. much for, for being here today. Um, thanks for all the, the clarification and sharing your wisdom and empowering people. Uh, I think your book is uh, fantastic. And um, yeah, I, I wake and do you have any final words on where people should go to, to seek you out? Sure. I mean, I, the I guess I don't know if it's lucky or not lucky, um, but having a name like Julia Rutledge, which is spelt in a slightly different, unusual way from how it's spelt for other people, means that you find me very, very easily. And so anybody can Google me and find lots of podcasts and lots of you know lectures that I've delivered, and they're all free online. And um, find my TED Talk if they want to watch that. 
Or the other thing would be um, that I developed a, a, a MOOC, which is a mass open online access course through the edX platform. And uh, that is a free course that people can do and learn more about the, the interface between nutrition and mental health. So it's a six module thing. So you'd need to invest a bit of time in it, but it's absolutely free unless you want to get a certificate. And that might be useful for a clinical psychologist. If they're wanting to upskill, they might want to pay the, mm -hmm. I don't know, 150 US dollars. It's not a, it's not a massive amount. I, and I know they keep discounting it. So I don't get any of the money. So I have no idea what happens, but. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, so if you did want a certificate, then there's a bit of assessment that's a, that is involved in, in testing your knowledge. Um, but I've, we've gotten lots and lots of great feedback. We've had over 30,000 people take it so far. So it's had, had broad reach. And so it'd be available for you guys to do in where you are. And so it's been done by people all over the world. So I would say really plug that. And of course, I'd love everybody to get hold of the better brain, whether it's out of the library or, or, um, you know, purchase it, but I'm, I'm more, I, I'm just keen on people reading it. So I don't care if you borrow it from your neighbor. <laughs> so <laughs> Great. Yeah. I, I don't know about those listening, but I'm, I, I enjoyed the book and I am going to check out that online course. I didn't know about it. So thank you for, yeah, for sharing that. Um, and thank oh, you again pleasure. for being here. Okay. Okay. Take care. Cheers.